Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a great pleasure to talk about something I've been worried about for the last 25 years. I was at Los Alamos National Laboratory when I started to think about the question, how do we balance the world's carbon budget? And of course, that relates to climate change. And from an energy perspective, it's actually quite simple, conceptually at least. We dig up carbon, we extract carbon out of the, out of the ground, we burn it up, we produce CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, and we just dump it into the atmosphere, and we leave it there. That's the basic premise, and we can't do this much longer than we already are doing it, because we have, in essence, a finite budget, because that carbon dioxide sticks first for centuries, then half of it is gone, and for thousands of thousands of years, and the other half acidifies the ocean. For it to get out of the system again takes tens of thousands of years. So we do uncontrolled dumping, and somehow or another we have to fix this. And I started to figure out ways of mineralizing the carbon dioxide to put it away underground. Other people said we can eject it underground. So we found ways of dealing with this problem from this perspective. And lots of people, when I gave talks, asked, what can I actually do to do this? Because this all sounds like heavy industry and doesn't directly affect me. On the other hand, if you start looking at how we started to solve the problem, we also started roughly 25 years ago at Rio with a treaty where the world agreed that we need to do something and cannot let harmful greenhouse gases pile up in the atmosphere. Then we went to Kyoto and more lately to Paris. And we always agreed on great top-down ways of solving the problem where everybody had agreements, lots of good ideas, and everybody was told what to do. And if you look back, nothing really much happened. So we have to figure out how to look at this problem from the other end and maybe start from the bottom up, which means we need to start thinking about individual responsibility, maybe the responsibility at a municipal level, on a state level, or on the, on the individual corporations. How can individuals and smaller entities actually take on responsibility for their own garbage and deal with the problem from that end? That is, in essence, the question we have to ask. And it's not all as e easy as you might think, because people have looked at this, and the first pe suggestion people have, change your lifestyle. Now, that may be helpful if you stop consuming things, you will emit less CO2, but it will take you a lot long time to get there. And by the way, asking people to do this nearly always engenders resistance. And let's be honest, this will take a generation or two before this change happens. And unfortunately, our carbon credit card doesn't have a limit that high. We will run out much earlier than that. So we have to come up with better ideas. People said, how about increasing efficiency and conserving? It works, it helps, but it can only reduce emissions. It cannot stop emissions. And we may already have gone over budget and have to figure out how to go negative. So being less positive is probably not quite enough. So that could work, but it won't get us there. Renewable energy will get us there if we push it long enough and hard enough. Unfortunately, there is a very entrenched, very powerful competitor which puts out lots and lots of fossil carbon. And while I'm very hopeful that in the end renewable energy will win the day, it will take time. And it will take too much time. And quite frankly, why are you allowed to say I'm working very hard, but I leave the rest of my garbage just out there in the atmosphere. Just This is effectively what we have agreed on in discussions like in Paris. Think about it for a moment if I just replace the word CO2 with garbage. So I'm dumping my garbage in the street in front of my house, and I tell you, you really shouldn't complain about it because I'm 20% better than last year. Right? Or I'm paying for your garbage, and therefore I'm allowed to put my garbage in the street. Right? That's what we do with CO2, so we have to change our view on that. In, in this environment, and, but keep in mind, we will make likely much more. Because if you think about it for a moment, there are a billion people on the planet who have no electricity, who have very, deal with very dirty water, they have no good access to water, they are poor, and they want to have economic development, and in order to give it to them, we need more energy. On top of it, I think the policy implications of telling the rich and developed countries that you cannot grow anymore are also unmanageable. So we have to figure out how to make this happen, how to get waste management in place while all the other things are going on and figure out how to do this. But if you come back to the individual and ask, where are you responsible? Well, if I look at myself, I drive a car 
and I have a gas heater at home, and a, and a hot, so every time I take a hot shower, I very directly put out CO2. If I decide to step on the accelerator of my car, I very directly put out CO2. And then, of course, I do things indirectly. I, in the evening, decide I want to, tomorrow morning, some piece of equipment from a uh, mail order place. Well, I can do so, and I, try, I get overnight delivery. Guess what? That truck put out CO2. So we have to, we can look at that, and then, of course, the goods I buy, bought also have CO2 involved. So we have to figure out how to, how to manage all of this. And I would argue, if you look at it from this perspective, you actually know that you can get volunteers behind something like this if you phrase it right, because there are people who are perfectly willing to pay an extra penny for renewable energy. There are people who pay for an electric car in order to avoid all of these emissions. So we need to tell them that we also need to clean up after ourselves, and maybe we can find enough volunteers to get started. So this is the, the first question. Then the next question is, can we actually do it? Is it feasible? And I would argue the answer is yes. We know how to put CO2 away. You can mineralize it. You can inject it underground. And you can even get it back from the environment. Uh, now, people have not done this very much because nobody ever asked you, but we can do it. And here at ASU, we are working on a device which can collect CO2 directly out of the atmosphere. In the dry air, it works marvelously well. Then we make it wet, it releases the CO2 again. We can think of this like a tree. It has leaves, the wind blows over them, the CO2 sticks to the leaves. We then free it again, we process it on, and we properly dispose of it. These mechanical trees are a thousand times faster than natural trees, so they are very good at what they are doing. And so you could, in principle, put together a way of making it happen. Uh, you have all the bits and pieces, the technologies are there. The technological fix could work if people are willing to do that. So that still doesn't answer the question, how can you, as an individual, make it happen? And I would argue you can get more efficient, you can change your lifestyle, but that, as I said before, is not quite good enough. So how can you get involved in making this problem go away? And I think, in part, you can do something which many of you will have done before, in the context of recycling. You start to volunteer and you do things and you will need help because you can go out and say, I have this stuff, the old newspapers, I put them at the curb, but quite frankly, you cannot recycle them yourself. You have to have help from a third party which comes, picks it up, processes it and puts it somewhere. So you should demand these kind of services and that is what individuals can do. You can go out and say, we want that CO2 back. So imagine for a moment, you were successful with this, and next time you drive to a gasoline station, uh, a gas station, you can go in and you can push a button and say for maybe 50, 60 cents more, I can get the 20 pounds of CO2, which are generated every time I put a gallon of gasoline out, uh, get, consume a, a gallon of gasoline, I can put back into the ground and safely put it away. I balance the books on my gasoline. You could imagine that a car company offers you a car which has 100, pound, 100 tons of CO2 built in. That is the lifetime emissions of a car which goes some 200,000 miles. Uh, and you can make it carbon neutral from day one by scrubbing out 100 tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere right away. One of the nice features is you have some flexibility when you do it and how you do it because the atmosphere is a good big buffer where you can hide a little bit of CO2 for a short time or take it out a few years earlier. It doesn't matter. So you have technology options. You can do that. You could answer to, to your mail order uh, on the computer. You could say, I want to pay back the, the, the CO2 which is emitted from the overnight delivery. I do want to take, and you could even go one step further and say, over my lifetime, I'm putting out 1,000 tons of CO2 or maybe 2,000 tons of CO2. Maybe I want them back. Maybe I take my parents' CO2 back. Right? And so gradually, we can, with volunteers, move forward. Now, I'm not kidding myself that volunteers will change the needle on climate change. But they, what they will change is change the debate. And that's just like with recycling. Right? Once everybody started to do it, suddenly policies came in place. And so, you know, it's a good thing, and we should actually support this and make it happen. And I think this will happen here, too. Once everybody can see it's a good idea, then it will work and it will move forward. Right? And so ultimately, when you do that, you give the politicians cover to say we do need to regulate this.
because without regulations, it will never get big enough to work. But on the other hand, learning by doing, which is what it will take to make it cheap, the first day around this will be expensive. Learning by doing only happens if you do. And for that, you need the volunteers. So the first time around is probably more than 60 cents on the gallon, and maybe the oil company was smart enough to eat some of that in order to make it work. But over time, I actually would predict it will get cheaper than that. And, and once there is enough of it going that people say, oh, it really works, and it is a good idea, you can move to the next step and make it happen. And I think technology and technological fixes have worked in the past, and we just need to step back and figure out what it is we are seeing here. And we see a waste management problem, and we need to think about it this way. And it's great if we figure out how to be more efficient, if we figure out how to recycle the carbon, and do all of these things as well. But the part we couldn't figure out any other way, we need to put properly away and not just let it sit in the atmosphere and wreak havoc on the environment. Thank you very much.